and welcome to a new season of the Oddity Archive, the show where production values is a dirty, dirty term. Well, I had two simple projects lined up for the between season break regarding Archive. One was to try and at least somewhat mellow out the truly lousy acoustics of my two production rooms, and the other was to replace the camcorder that I'd been using since 2013, which had been becoming an ever bigger problem for me, to the point where over the last six months or so, it became a flat-out liability. But uh, I got the new camcorder as you can hopefully tell. But the new camcorder, like dominoes, set off a big, long line of new problems. And as such, out of sheer necessity, I've had to spend the last few weeks basically reinventing how I make archive, really from the ground up. Uh, so much for those household repairs. But, uh, anyway... I really hope you like my down-the-rabbit-hole type episodes. Ah, uh, the delicious irony. I've had to bust out the old camcorder one last time just so I can show off the new one. But before we start, let me emphasize that I am not an expert when it comes to photography, uh, video or still. I know, you'd never notice. But uh, let's see, I took a semester of photography back in high school, and I'll be damned if I remember any of it. So, as such, my needs for a camcorder have been 100% born out of the problems that I've run into while making Archive over the years. So anyway, over the span of the last year and a half or so, the camcorder, the old one, the one that's shooting right now, has developed some problems. And the first one to occur was the power socket, uh, you know, to hook in the uh, AC adapter, developed a short in it. And the only way I can power this old thing through the wall, which is what I prefer because I don't like to deal with batteries, is to keep the cord at just the right angle in the hole, uh, in the plug. But the worst problem, believe it or not, that wasn't the worst of it, sometime around New Year's, the picture developed an intermittent connected pair of white dots in my shots, uh, right around this range that I'm trying to point to. And it really shows against black. But it made it look like I just had a dirty lens, but it's actually a pair of dying pixels. And it doesn't show up in the monitor here, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, so I won't know until I dump this footage into the computer before I find out whether or not it's been acting up again today. Now, this old camcorder was an open box deal that I got at Best Buy back in mid-2013. It was $150, and uh, I can't complain. I, I think I've gotten my money's worth out of it. But having said that, I've been wanting to replace it since before I started having those problems, but the models that I would have wanted to replace it with start around $2,000. So some compromises had to be made. And to put this in perspective, my initial budget was $600, and I had to bump it up to $850 before I got something that at least somewhat hit my three major targets and the only camcorder that, again, at least somewhat hit those three targets was the Sony FDR-AX53. And those three main targets were, number one, I wanted the ability to shoot at 24 frames per second, plus have an adjustable shutter speed. 
this is for when I deal with film stuff. And strangely enough, I was actually considering starting to regularly shoot archive at 24 frames a second. Um, everyone else seems to have gone over to 60 frames per second, which I honestly think looks kind of unnatural, uh, kind of exaggerated. Uh, I'm just not really a fan of it. But given how much old school NTSC video I work with, I decided to stick with the good old 30-ish frames per second, you know, to keep things consistent, because I deal with that a lot more than film. But anyway, getting back to the whole 24 frames thing, here's some test footage I shot of some film. And uh, no, those reels were not involved. I'm Kent Easton of Blackhawk Films. For nearly 50 years, we've had fun bringing classic films to collectors. But I'm convinced that the real excitement lies in the future, when you show sound films from your own library to your family and friends. Number two, the new camcorder needed a mic input, uh, preferably XLR. And uh, yes, I know I've got the female end right now. But uh, that's so I could use a normal old mic and mic cable in tandem with the camera. Now, unfortunately, the ones with XLR were way out of my price range. So I had to settle for a camcorder with an eighth inch, three and a half millimeter input, however you prefer to look at it. And there it is, the red thing. And so um, ever since day one, I have had to record my mic audio, uh, you know, the mic that physically sticks into the corner of the shot when I'm doing the box segments. I've had to do that all separately. And so I have to go back and resync it later on. And no two audio clocks are quite the same. So even though everything's recorded at the same bit rate, the raw camcorder audio and the mic audio just do not sync up. Now I can make things hold together for about a minute at a time, but then I have to start making uh, little edits and pulling back the audio and uh, just to keep things somewhat in sync. It's not perfect. Uh, it doesn't always work that well, and it's very time-consuming, and I'm just, I'm tired of it. So anyway, on to my last demand, and that would be number three, no more carpet vision. Unfortunately, I've had to settle for not as much carpet vision. In other words, uh, lighting at Archive HQ has always been at a premium. And I really don't want to have to start using those big LED panels, you know, where everything becomes a sterile, blown-out white. Uh, I know I'm kind of on the edge of that right now. But, you know, the, the real big things. And uh, so it seems like in the last couple of years, I've needed to get the camcorder into darker spaces. Uh, you know, like uh, when I'm working on a piece of gear or discussing it. And so the problem is that the consequence of that is that I get a noisy, blurry, distorted picture. Now, I can get a noise-free shot with the new camcorder, but it comes at the expense of the focus. In other words, the I like things to be in focus in the foreground and the background. And this doesn't do the greatest compensation job on smaller apertures. And uh, boy, that's a word I haven't used in years. But uh, anyway, those were the three main points. 
And so uh, I do have some more notes on this thing. And one feature that I was not shooting for, uh, so to speak, uh, it's turned out to be a big blessing. And that would be that this is a steady cam. So uh, let me open this up. You probably just saw the lens shift. But uh, yeah, you can probably see I can kind of jerk this camera around and the lens just bobs along with me. So, which it's great for uh, all the, my very, very long history of shaky cam. Uh, yeah, this is just wonderful. And it's made those moments where I need to manhandle the camera a lot more watchable. So I'm kind of looking forward to using this a little more often. So everyone jump up, jump up, and jump down, jump around, jump around. Now, admittedly, I do the final cut of Archive on Windows Movie Maker. And this is because it just works for the flavor, the aesthetic of Oddity Archive. But the thing is, it's an older program. And it's one of those ones that if I update the OS, I would lose it. And it doesn't support anything above 1080p. So even though the new camcorder does do 4K, and it does it surprisingly well, uh, despite my other complaints, uh, yeah, I still have to do the, my main shooting in 1080. I, there's just no way around that. Now, I know there's that subset of archive viewers that would probably love to see me drop all this digital nonsense and shoot on VHS, but that simply does not work, uh, especially on the more techy episodes, and it would make my workflow that much slower and that much less practical. But uh, anyway, let's take a quick look at my lights. One problem I have had since day one is that I've mostly relied on the sun for my lighting. <laughs> Not a great solution. But the worst problem has been dead spots in my lighting, and they've only gotten worse since I came to South Dakota, because imagine that South Dakota doesn't have as much sun as Colorado did. But anyway, my admittedly rather ghetto solution was to, now that I've got a place for one on top of the new camcorder, I'll just attach one to the top of the camcorder. So I went and ordered this used Sony HVL LE1, but uh, it was missing the adapter to, you know, hook to the top of the camcorder. But uh, as I soon found out, the replacement part was going to cost almost as much as the actual item. So I thought about it for a bit, and I soon came to the conclusion that, well, sometimes my lighting is so dark that... I could almost use two of these. And, you know, it's got hookups for a tripod, and I've got a spare tripod kicking around. Why not just make it two of these? So I went back and ordered a new, new, new one to go with this, and this just acts as a fill to use on an as-needed basis. So, yeah. Now, as for the unit itself, it's got a couple of diffusers in here, and uh, I think there's some you can buy aftermarket, but here's a flesh tone and just a general frost one back in there. And this is a very, very simple thing. It's just an on-off switch and a brightness control, and that's it. And I haven't really tested the auto exposure on the new camcorder yet, and it's on, so no time like the present. Let's see what happens here. Lovely. And I've got the brightness all the way down, so I'll crank it, although the camera will compensate, obviously, so, yeah. Play around with it a little there. But, uh, yeah, it just it seemed like an unusually elegant solution for the archive. <laughs> I don't get too many of those.
Okay, I'm using the computer's built-in mic for this segment. Now, after taking some test footage with the new camcorder, I, of course, wanted to dump it onto the computer so I could, you know, take a look at it. But as it turned out, the video file format that the Sony FDR-AX53 uses didn't exist as far as my iMac was concerned. Uh, read, I needed to get off my lazy ass and update the operating system. So upon updating the OS, I found that the update had crippled some of my software, most notably the Isotope Ozone Audio plugin which I use on about 98% of the archive's audio, including my record and tape transfers. So it cost me $300 to cross-grade to the latest edition, and it works okay and all, but everything got kind of moved around on me, so I'm still exploring it. I'm still getting used to it as of this segment, but I just thought I'd show this off briefly. Once I was finally able to dump my test footage onto the computer, I found that there was a lot of extraneous noise in the audio. Oh well, uh, and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that, even after eight years, still doesn't have the foggiest clue what it's doing. This is what I call a camera test. Why? Because I need a camera, but I've also got my microphone hooked to the camera. That's all I'm doing here. I'm just testing things out. And, well... <laughs> that sounds good. And welcome to the Oddity Archive. And welcome to the Oddity Archive. The show that needs a cute line. Oh well. Uh, and welcome to the Oddity Archive. The show that, even after eight years, still doesn't have the foggiest clue what it's doing. And well, <laughs> that sounds good. And welcome to the Oddity Archive. And welcome to the Oddity Archive. Which didn't really surprise me. I didn't expect the camcorder to have some great preamp built into it, you know. So anyway, my initial intent was to continue using my trusty old Shure SM57 and just use it in tandem with one of these fancy pants, handy dandy, newfangled XLR to three and a half millimeter adapter cables. Now, all microphones create some degree of noise on their own. It's called self noise. How creative. And SM57s have a lot of self noise. Uh, these are generally more meant to mic a snare drum in a rock group, or if it is used for vocals, it's in a live context where there's so much racket going on anyway that the noise level just doesn't really matter. So I figured, well, can't use that anymore, but I've still got my ancient Rode NT1 kicking around. which has a very, very low self-noise level. So I'll just use that. Now, I actually used the NT1 on the very first two episodes of Oddity Archive back in 2012, but I swapped it out for the Shure because the road, in my opinion, uh, fares better with sung vocals against an instrumental backing. Uh, you know, all mics have their own little frequency response, their own little curve to them, and to me the road is just better in a musical context. It, it helps the sung vocals kind of pop out a little more. 
So after the first two episodes of Archive, I swapped it out for the 57 because it's got a heftier, more in-your-face sound and just more of a narration-ish sound to it. But uh, yeah, I know this isn't what they're normally used for. So uh, necessity now dictates that I start using the Rode NT1 again, and I guess I'll just have to try and EQ it a bit and uh, see if I can't get it a little closer to my existing sound. Now, the Rode NT1, since we're on that subject, is a condenser mic, and condenser mics need a power boost, usually 48 volts, uh, aka phantom power, and my camcorder, shock of shocks, does not provide such things. So the bottom line is, Unless I want to go back to doing my audio separately and having to spend all that time resyncing it, I'm going to have to use some sort of interface to supply the power boost and pass the signal along to the camcorder. So I wound up settling on the Zoom H4n Pro field recorder, and here was my logic. Number one, and uh, really foremost, it can provide the voltage boost that's necessary for condenser mics, and it can output the sound using a 3.5 millimeter audio cable. No adapters necessary. Number two, since this is a field recorder, I can record a copy of my audio onto an SD card in there, uh, just in case something goes wrong on the way into the camcorder or the computer, or I just have some context where I would like to have an extra copy of it. And number three, uh, since it's a field recorder, it's got mics built into it. So this one's got a stereo pair built into it. So I can take this on location and use it either in tandem with uh, the camcorder or just on its own. I can keep using my regular mic and uh, I think that's what I'm going to do for the most part. I have done some testing with the stereo pair here, and it is underwhelming. I mean, I guess it would work in a pinch, but it's not something I'd want to use on a regular basis. Anyway, uh, lastly, number four, mono microphones, so uh, any microphone with a single diaphragm, uh, can be set in here to dual mono. So if I'm only recording one channel of audio, so to speak, it would be stuck to the left. It, it would only be the left channel. But this makes a copy of it, so it's simultaneously left and right, and it just comes out center in the greater scheme of things. Now, having said all this, there was one bummer to this thing, and that is that it came with no accessories. And I bought this new. Uh, this was not used. So I had to buy the accessory kit, or a pack, as it were, if I wanted important things like the AC adapter, windscreen, a very floppy one, uh, the USB cable, that might be good. But I especially wanted the AC adapter, and uh, I should say, I can buy all this stuff separately, but it was just cheaper to buy the kit. But anyway, uh, I found in experimenting with this that when I have the phantom power on, and I'm on batteries, I can use this thing for about an hour before I drain the batteries. So yeah, I definitely need the AC, if at all possible. Now, another thing the kit came with was an attenuator cable, and you'd think that would be a good thing, right? Because coming out of here, this is also the headphone jack, but it's line out, and the input on a camcorder, a mic input, is at mic level. Mic level is a lot lower than line level. So, yeah, you'd think an attenuator cable would be good. It would get it down to mic level, and you wouldn't have the distortion problems. There is many. But uh, as I found, it does its job, but you have to crank the volume up so high in the camcorder that uh, all the noise in the camcorder just kind of kills your own efforts. 
And I've really just had much better luck using a standard iPod cable and just dinking around with the volume on the headphone level. So, yeah, this was a kind of a waste for me personally, at least. And, uh, yes, uh, since I know you're going to ask, yeah, I'll be dressing this thing up as Don King for Halloween. Finally getting around to my other intentional summer project, I wanted to try and at least somewhat mellow out the notoriously echoey sound of my two production rooms, and you can probably still hear it right now. However, I do not wish to plaster a bunch of acoustic foam to my walls. Uh, really, the only way I would be open to something like that is if I were building a soundproof room, or uh, more accurately, hiring a contractor to build a soundproof room. Uh, I think people confuse soundproofing with acoustic treatment. Uh, you know, soundproofing is on a construction level, uh, building thicker walls and such. But anyway, what seemed like the most realistic solution for me, uh, given that it's all kind of one big experiment anyway, was the notion of portable acoustic baffles. Now, they do make and sell such things, but they can run into the hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, and they're usually pretty heavy, and despite the name, they're not really the most easily stored things in the world. So I decided to build my own stuff, and given that I would like to be able to just chuck them in the closet when I'm not using them, I'd like them to be compactable. If that's not a word, it is now. So for example, the shorter piece here, I built two of them, and uh, yeah, the gap in the cardboard makes sense now, doesn't it? But I can collapse it, and uh, this open part here can more or less be married to the separate panel, and I can just stick it all together and put it all together with an oversized rubber band. Nice and easy and light. You know, exactly what I wanted. Now, I built, uh, well, I built two of those, so yeah. Uh, I built four of these acoustic panels, these real big ones, uh, well, four feet at least, and they were made out of two pairs of locking egg carton acoustic foam. So if I had the companion piece, I could just stick it right on top of it and they'd fit right together, and that's that. Now, there's two configurations to all this. The one I would use for on-camera stuff is lining my open walls with the, you know, this stuff and uh, any big nasty spots on top of furniture I can stick the little ones onto. And the other one for off-camera stuff is I can build a little fortress out of it and make my own little makeshift ISO booth. And speaking of ISO booths, I was looking for some way to kind of... Uh, isolate the microphone as much as possible. So I was looking around online and what I saw the most were these um, little panels of foam that you could attach to a mic stand and uh, really uh, you got your microphone here, some foam behind it, but it's still all open, 98% open, and it's the least sensitive part of the mic back there anyway, so yeah that seems kind of stupid. And I was looking around, and I found uh, what was called the Porta Booth, which was basically a one-foot cubed uh, enclosure you can stick a mic into, and it's got a hole in the bottom for the stand and the cable and all. And it's made of the egg carton stuff. And if you get up to the high-end models, it's uh, it comes with a blanket that you can put all around the back of you. And you get to stand in there like an idiot in this tiny little booth and try and do voiceovers. And uh, that was $400. So um, I also saw what's called the eyeball, which is a hollowed out piece of foam with a hole in the bottom for the mic and mic stand and cable. And the front is cut out too. And there's a fitting pop filter you can stick in there. And uh, it didn't seem like too bad an idea. You know, I don't expect it to do a lot, but it was pricey. And even the knockoffs were really pricey. So I figured, well, 
you know, I can just get me a a one foot cube, solid acoustic foam cube, like a bass trap, hollow it out and build it to my own specs and keep it as thick as possible and just do whatever I want with it. And that's exactly what I did. So as part of my camcorder slash lighting slash field recorder testing, I recorded the making of my little cube thing, which I'm talking into right now and can't really show off. So yeah, here's a montage. And that's about where I normally sit from the mic. I usually sit around a foot away when I'm doing voiceover. So this is where I would be doing it. This is about how it would sound. Uh, yeah. Well, that's it for today's archive. <sighs> well, back to the drawing board. Okay, where's that button? There we go. <laughs> oh, screw Oddity Archive after dark. Give me Oddity Archive in the dark. Look at that. <laughs> oh.